how to make a language in seven easy steps. Linguist hater! Conlanging is the art of constructing languages, and it's very difficult to do it well. The typical gold standard of conlanging for world building and storytelling is to make a language that is naturalistically formed with an older version of the language or proto-lang that evolves over in world time in fiction um, to form a modern version of the language. And doing this well requires a pretty comprehensive understanding of linguistics and other languages, but it's also what the likes of Tolkien, did for his elvish language families, and it's what David J. Peterson did for Dothraki from Game of Thrones, and so lots of people want to try to do it, but not everyone has that kind of time or energy, but they would still like a functioning and phonoesthetically pleasing language for their story world, or sometimes as a meme, or sometimes for personal reasons, as a secret code, or as an art language to explore philosophy, or any other number of reasons. Let's do if this is you, because it's definitely me, then you're in the right place. We're gonna make today what is typically called a toy lang. Um, it's going to act loosely naturalistically, and it will at the very least sound cool. So just follow these simple steps and you'll have a pretty functional little engineered language for your use and whatever. So, step zero, gather existing words. Did you preemptively start a language before you had this guide and you want to incorporate those words into a full con lang? That's great. Gather them into a list. I will be proceeding as if you had no grammar rules yet. You probably have grammar rules, whether you know it or not, but this guide is going to pretend like you don't. Step one, figure out your language goals. Figure out what you want your language to do, what purpose you want it to serve, what culture you want it to represent, or what aesthetic you want it to have, or all of them. Write that down. This can help guide your decisions later in the process. For example, here's my objective from my seal tongue conlang to create a very simple, ocean-oriented language which can inspire the slang of selkies and form songs. Basically intended to be the Toki Ponita of my world, with some Kaleni relationals thrown in for good measure. Generally very minimalistic, it should be easy to sing, sound Japanese, and Norse. As you can see, mine states the cultural purpose, some grammar notes, some phonology notes, as well as uh, what I'm trying to do with it. Yours doesn't need these, it needs to have whatever you want it to have. Step two, language sounds and phonoesthetics. So phonoesthetic is the word for sound aesthetic. It's basically, we're gonna determine what sounds are in your language. Typically, you wanna use the International Phonemic Alphabet or the IPA for your phonology, AKA your language sounds, but we are not going to today. You are free to, um, I just don't feel like learning it, so I'm not gonna teach it to you, but there's lots of other people who can. And so if you need to, just Google it. There's a whole Wikipedia page on it, you'll be fine. Uh, but instead, we're going to create a list of sounds that we want in our language and associate each sound with a letter or group of letters. If you are working from a list that you made in step zero, write down all the sounds you see in that list. Divide them into consonant sounds like t, k, ch, sh, ts, n, th. Or, if you want to keep it simple, go through the alphabet and write down every consonant that you like in a list. Remember, though, to keep it simple as much as possible, one sound per symbol. Because, like, in English we pronounce C in, like, three different ways, and that's super confusing when you're just starting out. So definitely limit it, make sure you pronounce everything the same way every single time. Next, you're going to do the same thing for vowels. And if you are picking things out not from a list, the most common system is the five vowel system, in which you have A, E, I, O, U. Please remember one sound per symbol or group of symbols, because, you know, in English we have the very famous through, though, thou, tough, trough, and that's O, U, and all of it. So don't do this. English spelling sucks, and your language should be spelled consistently. If you don't like how it looks on the page, you can change it later when you're writing it out in, like, your fiction or whatever, but for your dictionary, for your own notes, please keep your spelling consistent so that you always know how to pronounce it 100% of the time. Step three. Grammar and syntax. So grammar and syntax describe how the language systematically works. Languages in the real world are absolutely wild, and this is the point where apps outside knowledge will benefit you the most. However, if you know nothing, this is still fine. If you're working from a list, uh, see what you already have, see if you've done this already, but let's break this down into smaller choices. We'll start with weird quirks. So, Yupik and Inuit infamously have somewhere around 800 words for snow, and this is only kind of true, it's complicated, just google it. And many other real world languages have different versions of the language spoken at different levels of formality. 
Uh, my demonic language forces everyone to conjugate verbs based off of if they're in debt to the person they're speaking to or not. Your language can literally accommodate whatever you want. I put this first because something like this will shape everything else. So make this decision now. If you want something really weird or out there, you want to have this language to be spoken entirely underwater, or you want it to be done with your fingers pinched on your cheeks the entire time, or you want a cat to speak this language, this is the time to decide that. Next, word order. This is the word in which you put clauses, that is, senses or complete ideas. Uh, let's take the example sentence, the dog eats food. There are three-ish types of words to account for in this. Subject, the thing in the sentence doing the thing, in our case, the dog. The dog eats food. Verb, the action sentence. What is the dog doing? Eating. Eats is the verb. The object is the thing receiving the action. What is the dog eating? Food. So food is the object. Um, and in this sentence, the is a definitive article, but we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so obviously sentences can be more complicated than this, but this is the basics. Um, for clarity, this is the order we speak in the language rather than the order we write. We'll discover that later. Um, if you're having trouble choosing, here are some examples. SVO order is the order we use in English. SOV order is used in Japanese, and it's actually one of the most common around the world. VOS order is rare, but still occurs in 3% of the world's languages. And freeform, you can say the words in whatever order you want, and you mark the subject and the object in a way that doesn't require order. You're probably putting the most new and broad information at the front, and the least necessary and most specific information at the end. But sometimes you can mark the information in other ways. Let's do a quick grammar sidebar here. I know you didn't come here for grammar or linguistics, but this is important. Take the sentence, I give you my lunch. The direct object is you, but I give you isn't a real sentence, or like, you know, if it is, it has like weird implications. The indirect object is my lunch, the thing being involved in the doing. So think about how you want to mark or place direct and indirect objects as well. All right, adjectives. Adjectives are descriptors used to modify words like good lunch, bad day. Um, your primary choices are to have them go before or after the word they modify. Um, also, I suppose adverbs technically go in here too, before or after the verb they modify, like I went, uh, went is not a good example, like, like I swam quickly or I didn't swim slowly. Um, if they go before, the adjectives probably used to be nouns, and if they go after, you're probably in an SOV languages in which they are initially separate verbs, like in Japanese, the word sumitai both means cold, the temperature, and also it is cold, the sentence. Prefixes, postfixes, and other affixes. Affixes attach to words in order to help you understand how they relate to other words. So when you say things like in, at, on, or honorable, do they go before or after the relevant word? In English, Inside, developed from in and side, getting merged together from being said so much. And so we have prefixes, inside. But we could, hypothetically, in another alternate universe, say side in and mean the same thing. So some languages have other types of affixes, though they're rarer. Um, like, for instance, infixes go in the middle of words, and the closest thing we have in English is our profanities, like abso fucking lutely. So, like that. So you can put those sorts of words wherever you want. Next, articles. Articles are words like the and a uh, in English. They evolved from demonstratives like this, that, and which, and we cannot sound sophisticated without them. For instance, if we say dog ate food versus the dog ate the food, one of these sentences sounds correct to us and the other one does not. However, in other languages, you can just say dog ate food and that's fine, obviously with the words in that language. So you should decide if you want articles, uh, how many of them you want, and when you use them plural and grammatical number. In English, we add s to the ends of words to make them plural, cat versus cats. But you could also change the vowels in the word to mark them plurality, goose versus geese. Other languages just use one word for both the plural and the, uh, the singular. For instance, one Pikachu, five Pikachu. You don't say five Pikachus, it's just five Pikachu. Some languages have singular exactly two and more than two, which is to say they have a separate word that means two things, of a, a pair. Some languages have what's called a palcal form, which translates to some, as in like some cats. So think about how you want to handle your plurals. Possession. 
In English, we can both say Brian's book and the book of Brian to mean the same thing, but Spanish doesn't have an equivalent of the apostrophe S system in English and only has of. Uh, Japanese only has an apostrophe S style system with the word no, so in Japanese, Brian no hon means Brian's book. So decide how you want your possession. Um, the possessor will typically act similarly to adjectives, but it doesn't have to. Grammatical gender. All right, so here's the one that gets confused the most. In real world languages, gender is often associated with the masculine and the feminine, but it doesn't have to be. Grammatical gender doesn't have anything to do with your actual gender or the actual genders of things like tables clearly don't have genders. It's just different ways that one handles grammars or groups of things. One could have natural and artificial as the grammatical genders, or you could have dogs, not dogs, cats, or fish and neither. Uh, in Spanish, you can typically tell gender by the ending of letters in the words, and this impacts the articles used. Los gatos, las fotografías. Um, so if you have gender, think about how do you want to mark it, what does it impact, and how does it impact the way people think in the language's culture. Ergativity and case marking. So in English, we say she likes her, but we cannot say her likes she. Uh, this is basically what ergativity and case marking is. Um, this is for marking nouns to indicate what role they serve in the sentence, typically marking the subject ob and object and such. Um, you pretty much need this in a free form system, but otherwise it's optional. So do you want this feature in your language? How do you want to mark it? You want to use different words? Do you want to just have affixes? Okay, lastly, and possibly my favorite, verbs. Verbs chase based on the context of the actions being done. The forms of the verbs we will make are called the infinitive. So in English, you'd say it as to eat, to drink, to run, to be. These are considered to be not conjugated. However, you can conjugate for a lot of things. And here's some examples to draw in, but feel free to use multiple of these at once or none of the following systems. Person, I eat, but he eats. In Spanish and in many other romance languages, it conjugates for first person, second person, third person, first person plural, second person plural, and third person plural. Negation, in Japanese, Verbs don't conjugate for person. It's just, you just say the same verb regardless of what or how many people are doing the action, but you do conjugate for if it happened or not. I eat, I don't eat. Formality. In Japanese, again, there are several different conjugation systems for if you're being polite or not. Tense, time. I eat versus I am eating versus I will eat versus I ate versus I ate every day. All of these tell you when the eating is, was, or will be happening. Mood. If I were a rich man versus if I was a rich man, one of these things is called the subjunctive mood. It didn't or hasn't happened, but if it did, it's, you know, it's kind of more polite. And the other is more definitive, it definitely happened. So you can make up your own moods. You could make one conjugation that means if I were a rich man, which I want to be, but I'm not, and a different one that means if I were a rich man, which would never happen and I don't want it to happen. And you could do it with just one word. So that's pretty cool. That's what's neat about moods, though it's a bit difficult to have moods, I understand, if you're initially an English speaker, which I'm assuming if you're watching this video, you are. Uh, lastly, how do you know the information? Did you witness the information firsthand? Is it a well-known fact? Is it your opinion? Do you doubt its validity? This is a feature in a lot of languages, notably not English, so that might also be a bit tricky for you to include, but don't, but feel free to change your verbs based off of how the speaker knows the information that they're presenting. And there are a lot more options. Verbs are one of the broadest things in language because you can create any number of things for which to conjugate, so be creative and have fun. All right, next, step four, consonant vowel clusters. Ordinarily, to form words, as I've mentioned, you will make a proto-language first and derive all your modern vocabulary through it. It's typically inspired by real trans sound transitions that happened in actual linguistic history. We are going to do a simplified version of this. Firstly, we're going to determine what consonant vowel clusters are allowed in language. Look at the following words. As you can see, these are obviously all from different languages, and you can tell because of how long the words are and the consonant vowel clusters they follow. If you're working from a list, find the structures of the words on the list by writing a C for every consonant and a V for every vowel in order, like I've done above. And if there's any compound words, that is a word that's made from two or more words in them, like pine, apple, swords, man, break them up. And if you're starting from scratch, I recommend making everything CVCV or CVC. So why do I recommend making such small words? That's because you can concatenate them later, which is to say put them together like the words to and gather, and that makes even more words. Alternatively, I recommend making it CVCVCV or CVCVC. 
but making certain orders of vowels mean something specific. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Feel free to create CV structures that include a specific letter in them, such as C parentheses R V C. This isn't exactly how you're supposed to use CV in actual linguistics, but it helps me keep everything clear. And there's also a lot of auto word generators that use this sort of format. So I recommend it. And when you've decided on your potential word structures, we can move on to our next step. Step five, word formation. The next step is to start filling in the C's and V's with the sounds from the list earlier, and then assigning them meaning. Please see the conlang template in the doobly-doo below if you're looking for a list of words to create. Alternatively, I recommend Google vocabulary list for learning a new language because that's a good place to start. But now we're going to start associating certain sounds with certain meanings. While you're doing this, if you ever find a collection of letters you don't like, for instance, I'm not usually a fan of V and G together or S and J together, make a note of this to yourself or the rest of your sounds so it's banned from the language. Keep in mind, you might not only like the sounds at the beginning of ends of words. It's the same way we don't have NG at the beginning of words in English, only at the end, but in like Vietnamese, it's super common. Now, I'm relatively minimalistic with my conlang, so I try to repurpose existing words to make new words based off of how my story world cultures would perceive the world, but you can try any of the following to make some words. You can mash old words together to concatenatively to form larger Franken words, like Franken words from Frankenstein and words. You can change the vowels to form a different word, such as how freeze is the present tense of froze. You can use old words in new contexts. For instance, in English, we say to cast magic in the same way we would cast fishing rods or to cast clay pots. So think about how people conceptualize things in your world. Remember, having language blank spots can be as significant as the words you do have. Uh, Dothraki from Game of Thrones by David J. Peterson infamously has no word for thank you. That's what like won him the whole tournament thing. If you're struggling to decide what letters to put in your words, remember you can always just put something in, and if you really can't decide, just roll dice randomly to generate it. Or try looking up awkwards. I put a link to that in the doobly-doo. That will also auto-generate words from your CV structure. In fact, if you programmed a program to do all of these steps, you could 100% auto-generate a whole little language with this. And remember, you can always tweak things later. Languages in the real world are always evolving too. All right. Step six, at this point, it's simply a question of building until you're done with all the words you need. And that could be never. So for the purposes of my exercise, I like to do 111 words and then translate the following sentences. Hello, my name is, and then a name in the language. Life is good. That red thing was very bad. It was the worst. In the morning, you will go to the city. I should fight with you. Excuse me, do I know you? What is that? They understand my mother because she uses magic. Last year, there were 1,111 green creatures, or insert an important creature you want to have a word for here. He said, I like animals. Congratulations on your daughter. I love you. Keep in mind when translating sentences, other languages aren't just secret codes where you change a few words. Like, you don't look up the translation for life, and then a translation for good, and then a translation for is. Other languages are entire entities and cultures of their own, and the words in these languages should have different implications than ours. Look at the following translations for Life is Good from my conlang Shahirzani. Arashas gerumakt vid. The concept of life is objectively good. Irash gerumakt vid. My life is good. Irash gerumakt vid. In my opinion, the concept of life is the same as the concept of goodness. As you can see, they're all different. And this is how actual languages work in the real world as well. If you want to replicate naturalistic languages, then try to capture this essence when you're making your translations. All right, step seven is optional. So if you want to leave, now's the time to do it. It's to create a writing system. Hypothetically, your writing system will start as a pictography, as all writing does, influenced by being carved or painted and constrained by the medium in which it's portrayed, which is to say if you're writing on trees, it's vertical, it's horizontal on white things, it's curved if it's going to be with brushes, it's lines if it's going to be carved, and so forth. Then you simplify the pictures, or you don't, until it reaches its modern state. So think about how the medium impacts your writing, and design it to be maximally easy for the writers using it. The most important thing to remember about writing is it should be designed for your conlang, not for English words. It may or may not work nicely with English, and doing a one-to-one -one character conversion is rather silly. So don't just look at English alphabet and put down a new symbol for every letter in our alphabet. Come up with something else. Do one for every sound in your language, not in English. Okay, 
A couple of sample writing systems, of which yours may be one or a hybrid of. Alphabets, this is what we have in English. One symbol for every consonant, one symbol for every vowel. You place them one after another. Abugidas, Devanagari, as well as Tolkien Elvish are both Abugidas. Basically, it's the same as an alphabet, except for you write the vowels above and below the consonants they modify instead of the right or the left. Or more, more pre precisely, it's perpendicular to the writing direction. Syllabary. This is where every possible syllable in your language has a symbol and works best with CV languages as opposed to CVC or any language with bigger consonant vowel clustering. Uh, Japan is once again famous for its two syllabaries, hiragana and katakana. Lastly, logography. This is where every word has a symbol. Most language begins this way until the pictures that are used to represent sounds and it's simplified. Modern Chinese is still a pictography though, so feel free to use this. This part is pretty unnecessary in to have a fully complete language. After all, most people will not put in the effort to learn to read the symbols anyway, but they do already read the Roman alphabet. So feel free to just write out the sounds as you've been doing with words you picked earlier. And now you're done! For now, you will likely want to go back and fill in a bunch more of the language, add more culturally specific words, and figure out how longer clauses work and other such things. But for now, you've got a solid little language in which speakers could have a conversation, and from which you could create idioms and sayings, and, most significantly, a sound system to create names for people and places and things. So good work! Thank you for joining me for this little journey. I am so thirsty because I didn't drink water during this, so I'm gonna go do that. I have very few visitors, so please, please uh, hit that subscribe and like button if you like what you saw. Um, feel free to rewatch this so that you can get a better sense of how to do all the steps. And if you're feeling so inclined, check out my ASMR casual conlang showcases where I put together all these steps to form my own constructed languages. And uh, with that, I will see you on the flippity flop. Take care.